Welcome to the Horror Unmasked Podcast, where we unmask the monsters and, and explore, explore the lore. lore. I'm Amber. And I'm Lily. And today we will be dissecting Gremlins. It's feeding time. We see an inventor named Rand Peltzer going into a shop in Chinatown to sell his creations and buy a present for his kid for Christmas. Rand goes down into one of the shops and looks around. Rand tries to sell one of his faulty products to the shop owner when he hears something squeaking from the back of the shop. When he goes to investigate, he finds a small creature called a mogwai that starts to sing to him. It's me. I know, right? <laughs> Thinking it's a perfect gift for his son, he tries to buy him off the shop owner. Even after offering $200, the owner turns him down, saying that the mogwais are a great responsibility. The shop owner's grandson tells Rand to meet him out back and gives him the mogwai for 200 saying they need the money. The grandson tells Rand three rules to follow when taking care of a mogwai. One, keep it out of the light. Two, don't let it get wet. And three, never feed it after midnight. Back in a town called Kingston Fall, a boy named Billy has trouble starting his car and is forced to walk to work at the bank. Billy takes his dog, Barney, with him and puts him under the desk to hide him. A woman named Mrs. Deagle ugh, ugh. is walking very angrily through town with a giant snowman head when she walks into the bank and cuts everyone in line just to talk to Billy. She tells Billy that his dog broke her snowman and wants to take Barney to the kennel so they'll put him down. She's psychotic. I, really? fucking feral i can't believe some of the shit she sh said in this film right i may not be like the biggest fan of dogs but god damn no she said if she took him then she would put him in the dryer on the high heat spin cycle yes <laughs> fucking psycho <laughs> crazy barney unties himself from under the desk and attacks mrs beagle as, as, as he, he should. should like legit like she just threatened his life yeah fuck her <laughs> You know? Mm -hmm. Fuck her up, Barney. I know, right? We then see Billy drawing at a bar when one of his co-workers, Gerald, comes to talk to him about his career. One of his other co-workers, Kate, is working as a waitress. When taking their order, Gerald tries to flirt with Kate, who is obviously interested in Billy. When Billy gets home, he tries to help his mom, Lynn, out in the kitchen with cracking some eggs using his father, Rand's inventions. But it ends up malfunctioning. When Billy's mother asks him about his day, Rand ends up coming home from his business trip. Billy and his mom greet Rand at the door when Rand surprises Billy with the gift. Billy opens the box to find the little mogwai pop out of the box and start cooing. He's so fucking cute. Honestly. For real. The mogwai is small and fluffy with really big eyes, and Rand says he calls him Gizmo. Lynn tries to take a picture with the Flash and ends up freaking Gizmo out. Rand takes this opportunity to tell Billy the three rules about the mogwai. Back up in Billy's room, he's playing music for Gizmo on the piano, and Gizmo starts to sing for him. Billy puts a Santa hat on Gizmo and tries to show him what he looks like, but instead flashes a light in his face, causing him to fall in the trash. Billy takes Gizmo to the bathroom to clean him up and puts a bandage on his head, where he bonked it. He got a little boo-boo. He got a little bonk. The next morning, Billy tries to make a glass of orange juice using his father's invention, but it ends up malfunctioning, of course. Of course. And exploding juice all over the kitchen. And not even a little bit. Like it was it everywhere. Was there was so much shit everywhere. All over the walls. Just. And the cabinets. And his face. Wild. How much shit was all over that like, place. Like I didn't know an orange. Like one orange could, would, could do that. Could do that much damage. Meanwhile, a little boy named Pete comes into the house to deliver the Christmas tree. Fucker just walks in. The door yeah. is just unlocked. Maybe that was like that in the 80s. Who knows? You know, 
Gizmo is upstairs watching TV when Billy decides to show him to Pete. He's, not, he's just watching the TV. Hey, he's just chilling out, hanging out. Mm-hmm. Little dude. <laughs> I want a little dude. I want a little dude. Stop. That makes it sound like we want children. Uh, no, I, I mean, want I a do. little dude as in like a <laughs> fucking cat. A sh- yeah. sweet little boogus. Yeah. Because th- it's great when they curl up and watch TV with you and they're interested in what you're watching. Exactly. I love it that uh, Topaz is interested in Vampire Diaries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that. It's so cute. <laughs> For reference, that's my baby kitty if this ends up going in the podcast. Hey, it will. <laughs> that's my baby girl. My new kitten. Trying to get Gizmo to sing, Billy takes him to the table with the piano. Pete goes to pick him up, but ends up knocking a glass of water onto him. Big uh uh-oh. Gizmo falls over, screaming as his back begins to bubble. (gasps) Suddenly, multiple small, fuzzy balls spring from his back. The balls begin to unravel, revealing five more tiny mogwai. Gizmo looks distraught. Rand is downstairs playing with a new invention when Billy comes down to tell him what just happened. Billy shows his dad the new mogwai and says that one of them with a stripe on his head seems like the leader and that they're not like Gizmo. Immediately, Rand starts thinking about turning this into a business proposition. Tisk tisk, Rand. I know, right? Tisk tisk. Later that night, when all of the Mogwai are asleep, Billy hears whimpering coming from outside. Billy goes outside to find Barney hanging from some Christmas lights on the porch. Billy talks to his dad, who decides to take Barney to a family friend's for a few days to keep him safe. Billy decides to take Gizmo to one of his science teachers, Mr. Hansen, to check out the Mogwai. Billy puts a couple drops of water on gizmo creating even more mogwai mr hansen asks to keep one so that he can run some tests billy stops by the bar as it's closing where he runs into kate and his next door neighbor murray they all are outside when murray finds that his snowplow has been ripped into on the inside where he blames gremlins saying that foreigners have been planting gremlins inside their machinery to destroy them. Murray, obviously drunk, decides to walk home instead. Billy and Kate walk through the town, looking at Christmas lights and chatting it up. Kate confesses, I know, right? Kate confesses that she doesn't celebrate Christmas and gets upset when Billy teases her about it. Kate goes inside her home, all giddy, after Billy asks her out on a date. (laughs) Teehee. Back at Mr. Hansen's classroom, he's running some tests on the Mogwai late at night. At Billy's house, the rest of the Mogwai are begging for food, hopping up and down in their little box. Mm -hmm. Billy gives in, since the clock says it's not midnight yet. Gizmo sits on the bed, judging the other Mogwai for the way they eat, because they're eating like Mm -hmm. pigs. Billy offers Gizmo some chicken, but being the good boy that he is, he politely declines. Mr. Hansen calls it a night at his office when he leaves a sandwich in close enough reach to the Mogwai's cage. When Hansen leaves, we also see that the time is actually way past midnight, meaning the Mogwai at Billy's house messed with his clock. Mm-hmm. You see that cut cord back there and everything? Mm-hmm. The next morning, Billy calls his mom upstairs to find all of the mogwai, except Gizmo, encased in these hard, reptile-like shells with goop on them. Billy discovers that his clock's wires had been broken. Pete and Billy go to Hansen's office to find the mogwai he had been running tests on also is in a shell. Lynn is at the house alone when the shells start to open. Mr. Hansen is in his classroom teaching when his mogwai shell starts to crack as well. The bell rings to end school and Mr. Hansen goes to check on his shell to find it completely cracked with nothing inside. He calls Billy to get him to come to the school. Mr. Hansen tries to lure the mogwai with a candy bar when it grabs his arm and pulls him. Billy arrives at the school to find Hansen dead on the floor with a needle in his butt. What a way to die. I know, right? Billy tries to use the phone to call for help, but a reptilian hand comes up and scratches him. 
Billy runs to the nurse's office to bandage himself up when the cabinet opens and the creature begins to throw things at, at him before escaping through the wall. Lynn hears commotion coming from upstairs back at the house when we see Gizmo pinned to a dartboard. Sweet boy! Lynn grabs a knife and goes upstairs to investigate. When she reaches the top, she finds all of the shells hatched and empty. The phone starts to ring and Billy warns his mom to get out of the house, but the creature disconnects the line. Billy runs home while Lynn prepares for an attack, wandering the house with a knife. Lynn reaches the kitchen where one of the creatures is raiding the fridge. Another one of the creatures is eating something out of the blender when Lynn decides to turn it on, killing it. The other creature that was eating out of the fridge starts throwing things at her until she stabs it to death. Behind her, she hears another one. Lynn grabs it and puts it in the microwave, causing it to explode. Lynn's a badass. Hell yeah. Lynn continues to go through the house until she backs into the Christmas tree where one of the creatures is hiding. It attacks, knocking Lynn to the floor with the tree on top of her. Billy walks in on the creature scratching his mom when he picks it up and throws it into the fireplace. The last creature, the mogwai that had the stripe on his head, jumps out the window and escapes. Billy sends his mom to a neighbor's house and continues to search his own when he hears Gizmo cooing in the cabinet. Billy is outside searching for stripe while Gizmo is tucked away in his backpack. Billy follows some tracks to the Kingston Falls YMCA and breaks in. A bell goes off and Stripe jumps out, attacking Billy, before jumping into a pool of water. The pool bubbles like crazy as it glows green and begins to smoke. Realizing the town is in trouble, Billy goes to the police to tell them what has happened, but they obviously don't believe him. Billy tries to show Gizmo to the cops. Meanwhile, multiple gremlins run out of the YMCA. There were, <laughs> that scene was so funny because like <laughs> it looked like stop motion. Mm. And it was like just a bunch of them just like kind of like robot walking out. They yeah. weren't even really running. At Murray's house, the cable goes out as gremlins are messing with his antenna. Murray goes outside to check, but it's fine until he hears ruckus coming from his shed. Murray's snowplow comes bursting through the wall as gremlins drive it straight through his house and into Murray and his wife. Dun dun dun. All right. No, or should I say womp womp? <laughs> womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> we then see the gremlins all over town killing people and causing mayhem. Billy's showing Gizmo to the police and trying to tell them about the gremlins again when the phone rings and they get a call about Murray and his wife. Billy tries to tell the cops it's the gremlins, but they still don't believe him as they leave Billy to check out the accident site. How do you not believe him after he just showed you a brand new creature that you've never seen before? I know, right? And then you get a call about some weird shit happening? Anyway. Right. At Miss Beagle's house, she begins to feed all of her cats when something comes through the cat door. Hearing music coming from outside, Miss Beagle goes to splash water on what she thinks to be Christmas carolers, only to find gremlins waiting for her on her porch. Miss Beagle goes back inside and tries to go up the stairs using her electric chair, but instead gets flown up and out the window. The cops see this happen in their car as one of the gremlins messes with their brakes. The gremlins are attacking everyone, including Pete, and the cops drive away before they can get attacked. When trying to break, they end up crashing instead. Billy gets in his car with Gizmo, and to his surprise, it turns on. Back at the bar, Kate is serving all of the gremlins as they are only causing chaos, drinking beer, swinging from the ceiling, and playing card games. Kate finds some matches to light one of their cigarettes, but ends up scaring some of them away with the bright light of the flames. She then finds a camera and starts taking pictures of them with flash. Kate tries to escape, but is stopped by one of the gremlins with a gun. Billy pulls up to the bar and flashes his lights inside, allowing Kate to get away. When they try to drive away, the car stops working. They decide to make a run for it into the bank. 
when they make it inside, they find that the gremlins have already ransacked the place. Billy, Kate, and Gizmo decide to hide out in the bank when Kate opens up about why she doesn't celebrate Christmas. She revealed that the cops found her father dead in the chimney, trying to climb down and pretend to be Santa Claus. Instead of making it down with all of the presents, he broke his neck and got stuck. That's tragic. So tragic. Spoiler warning. Skip ahead. When the streets are quiet again, the group decides to go back outside. Billy thinks all of the gremlins have gathered together to get away from the sunlight, since it will be day soon. The group finds all of the gremlins hiding out at the theater, freaking out over watching Snow White and wreaking havoc inside. Kate, Billy, and Gizmo go to the boiler room, where Billy opens the gas line and lights a piece of newspaper on fire. Stripe sees a candy sign from the shop across the street and decides to go check it out. Billy, Kate, and Gizmo go to run outside, but the gremlins see them and try to chase them. The three make it outside and are able to trap the gremlins in before running farther away. The gas finally reaches the burning newspaper and the theater explodes, killing all of the gremlins inside. Stripe sees the building explode from the store across the street and runs farther inside, but not before Kate and Billy see him. The group follows him in and Billy tells Kate to take Gizmo to find a light switch while he looks for Stripe. The two share a kiss before parting ways. Oh. Billy goes to the back of the store with the electronics when all of the TVs turn on, showing Stripe's face. Meanwhile, Kate finds the control room for all of the lights and electronics and starts flipping switches. In doing so, she also flips a switch for one of the water fountains, turning it on. Uh-oh. Womp womp. <laughs> Billy. <laughs> a womp womp. Yeah. Billy goes through the toy section and starts getting attacked by Stripe, who escapes on a tricycle. It's fucking so silly looking. Yeah. <laughs> Kate looks back at the bag to find Gizmo, gone. Oh no, where'd he go? Billy continues to go through the store, looking for Stripe, when he is attacked again by Stripe, who shoots him with a crossbow in the arm, which is so violent. Yeah. <laughs> it's so sudden and so violent. I mean, it's, like a, so it's violent. a tiny crossbow, but that still did some damage. Yeah. Like, that's still in your arm. That's still in his arm. Somehow, Stripe has found a chainsaw <laughs> and comes after Billy, who picks up a bat to deflect the machine. Gizmo finds a Barbie car and begins <laughs> to drive around looking for Billy. He's so fucking cute. It's he unreal. Is. He is Barbie. He's just so cute. I would have. Oh, my God. Watching that, I was like, hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Kate finally finds the switches for all of the lights and flips them causing Stripe to be blinded and get dragged away by the chainsaw cord. That was funny, too. He Just the fucking weird drag. <laughs> yes, 100%. Because the chainsaw is, like, so vibrating. So, it, like, weird. it's, like, going across the floor and, like, he's wrapped up in the cord, so he's just going with it. It's so funny. The chainsaw gets unplugged and Stripe gathers himself before finding the water fountain and a gun. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Rand is driving around with Barney, but when they stop next to the shop that Billy and Kate are in, Barney jumps out of the car and goes straight inside. Gizmo is still driving around the store when he runs into Barney, who follows him in his mini car. So fucking cute. It is cute. Billy comes across Stripe, standing on the edge of the fountain, pointing the gun at him. Stripe shoots at Billy, but misses. Gizmo drives wildly as Stripe puts his hand on the fountain, causing his entire back to bubble up with the promise of new gremlins. Gizmo drives up a ramp and crashes behind the fountain. He then pulls a lever behind him that causes the sunroof for the fountain and the mini garden to open, exposing Stripe to the sun. Stripe begins to melt as Kate, Rand, and Barney come into the room to see Stripe's demise. Looking goopy and gross as his skin falls from his body. Stripe falls into the fountain. Billy picks Gizmo up and wraps him in a scarf to protect him from the sun. Billy looks at the fountain again, which is bubbling with fog, as Stripe's skeleton jumps out at him, falling to the floor and melting into a pile of goo. 
Ew. Super fucking gross scene. Yeah. Is just him fucking melting. Back at Billy's house, Gizmo is all wrapped up, seeming to not be feeling very well. All of a sudden, the shop owner from Chinatown appears in their house. The shop owner scolds the family for the damage they have done across town. Everyone thinks it's best to give Gizmo back to the shop owner, but not before Gizmo can say goodbye to Billy. The shop owner tells Billy that he may be ready someday to take responsibility, but until then, Mogwai will be waiting. The shop owner leaves with Gizmo, and the entire family, including Kate, send him on his way. The end. That's it, guys. That's the that's the episode. That's it. <laughs> oh, man. Nah, just kidding. So this movie was released June 8th, 1984. Yep. The director is Joe Dante, distributed by Warner Brothers. The setting is Kingston Falls. I have the box office. Do you have their cost? Like their budget? Yeah. What's their budget? Their budget was only $11 million. Holy shit. Because what they made in box office is was, crazy. Their box office is $212.9 million. Yep. Holy shit. Yep. I was expecting you to like give me a, a bigger number. For their budget no but when you said that and then i was like god damn they fucking made so bang. when we were talking about violent night and you were like saying how that box office was really big i was sitting there like <laughs> not I totally forgot about to gremlin holy shit and that's so crazy because this is like this is an older film and they just they yeah. made so much for this mm -hmm. and the music was by jerry goldsmith yeah um, it got an 86 on Rotten Tomatoes, so that's really good. Yeah. Like, their budget and their rating is really good. Yeah. And it has a runtime of 106 minutes, so this one is also almost two hours long. Almost, but not yeah. bad. Not bad. No. Um, we got our main actors here. We have Zach Galligan as Billy Peltzer, Phoebe Cates as Kate Berenger, Corey Feldman as Pete, and Howie Mandel as Gizmo. <laughs> yeah but you wouldn't know that un unless like you just wouldn't know you didn't re you wouldn't realize that howie mandel was mm -hmm. actually the voice of gizmo i'm also gonna say hoyt axon for rand so do you want to go first or me go first uh, i rambled on a lot last time you can you, you, you go ahead let's rip into this take the stage and then i'll go let's go for it all right so here's some funny things about this so they actually were trying to figure out how the hell they were going to create these creatures in a pre-CGI era. Because mm. it was it was the director, Joe Dante, their producer, Michael uh, Finnell, and their executive producer, Steven Spielberg. Yep. And they were like, how the fuck are we going to make these things? You mean? They're just like little puppets, right? That's what I'm guessing. And trust me, it was crazy because here's the wild thing. Is they had that, already done Star Wars and Yoda. I don't want to hear it. But here's the thing. There's a size issue with it that mm. they were having problems with. Okay. But Joe Dante actually admitted that they tried to use monkeys to play one of the, <gasps> the, be the beasts, one of the monsters. One of the gremlins. They got a rhesus monkey and got a gremlin head on him. But he ran around all over the editing room and shat <laughs> all over everything. As he should. That sounds like animal <laughs> And they realized cruelty. it was not going to work. Yeah, no. I mean, they use animals and they use animal actors all no, the time. Know, but like. I'm kidding. This was definitely like, a struggle. Using animal actors and then using animal actors in suits. Yeah. That sounds wrong. Yeah. So Chris Wallace was the designer of the Gremlins. Mm -hmm. And his design made the film like delightfully unique because even though they pushed the boundaries of special effects for 1984 uh they were there were numerous limitations to the design as they eventually ended up being hugely frustrating for the filmmaker this was because they were so tiny <laughs> and uh they were fiddly and repeatedly broke down they're just little babies they're just tiny little things the, literally, the puppet for Gizmo proved to be so infuriating oh. that the crew created a list entitled Horrible Things to Do to Gizmo. What? 
because they were so infuriated no, how by dare how they? tiny it was. How dare they? They had a list no. called horrible things to do to Gizmo. <laughs> and then, But that's so mean. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. I don't care how many problems a puppet is giving you. <laughs> it's Gizmo. Fuck off. I know, right? Well, the thing is, is Gizmo wasn't like the, 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 the weight behind Gizmo wasn't a thing yet because it was just being made. Yeah. I would love to see something now where it's just Gizmo doing things. I don't care. I don't need a plot. I just need like I a curious want... George, but you want a curious Gizmo. <laughs> you want like a curious gizmo like a nighttime stroll with gizmo as he goes around and just looks at shit i just want to see him doing stuff like yeah gizmo goes to the zoo gizmo <laughs> gizmo's gets glorious a, goods gizmo's go- gizmo gets a spa day yeah gizmo goes to the beach goes to the beach oh oh gizmo imagine sunglasses on and like little like sunscreen on his nose and then him interacting with like a crab or little turtle baby turtles oh my goodness Ah. okay make this happen i know right i don't need plot i just need just replace curious george with curious gizmo it's it's, it's easy that's so cute (laughs) fucking cute wait that's brilliant so fucking cute. Come to the Horror Unmasked podcast where we give lots of entertainment ideas. I know, right? I know, right? But here's the nice thing. So kind of getting back to it, Chris, who was the designer of Gre- the Gremlins, was mm-hmm. actually given a lot of uh, freedom to come up with the design for them mm-hmm. because there were no other designers on the creature. They started with Chris Columbus script description and worked from there. Yeah, because the Mogwai would end up being very similar to the original description, roughly ten inches tall, furry with pointed ears. Mm-hmm. The Mogwai were ten inches tall still sounds I know too big. right, but they're not even like a foot tall. I know they're just a bit little things. <laughs> <laughs> the Mogwai were initially brown with fully furred ears, mm. And apparently it came from Steven Spielberg's office to remove the fur from the ears and make them more translucent, like the like the way they are in the film. Yeah, which is cute. I like that it looks like like little cat ears or something. And what's funny is they actually changed the fur to match Steven's dog's coloring, Steven Spielberg's dog's coloring. <laughs> and of course, when it was decided that one Sorry. of the- I just really bad thought what you said say it again they went they changed the fur to match steven's dog's coloring yeah those dogs are dead now <laughs> like they're just they're dead they're, they're, they're dead they're, they're gone jesus christ that was such a bad thought you to went have. so morbid why did i get there why did i get you know to i don't point? know because <laughs> i was thinking like wow this movie came out almost 40 years ago that dog is not around what jesus you... <laughs> christ <laughs> anyway <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> so dark. Um, R.I.P. I hope he has many dogs now. Um, we still love him. Getting back on topic. <laughs> I'm really bad. So when it was decided that one of the Mogwai was not going to change into a gremlin, but stay the same and be Billy's friend, mm-hmm. they had to come up with a defined visual cue that would identify Gizmo from the rest of the Mogwai. So they gave him an eye ring of white fur as ah. the cue. So he was the only one that had like a ring on his eye. Topaz has that. <laughs> She's like a little bandit. Yee, so cute. And then the gremlins went through a longer and more involved design process, though, because the original description had them being armored with well, long tails and horns replacing the ears. So more kind of demon-like and there was definitely more discussion about the look of the gremlins as there were about the look of the mog the mogwai so there was more going into the discussions of the gremlins well that makes sense because they're bigger and there's yes and they're kind of like a you know they're like a weirdly not evolved they're reptilian so more reptile like so one of the important design considerations was to have some follow through on the biological look of the creature Mm -hmm. so at the time that they were designing 
them, the project was still a straight horror movie as there was no gizmo yet at the time Mm. when it was originally being done. So working chronologically, it started with the Mogwai and uh, when they felt they were all in agreement with the direction that the design was taking, they started on the Gremlin design. The description that... Uh, Chris had in the script of them really had no relation to the Mogwai's description. So he did a few like napkin, like, you know, when they could do like napkin sketches to try and get a look at what they wanted the gremlins to, to look like Mm -hmm. they wanted to make sure he wanted to make sure that it looked like it came from the Mogwai as they liked the look. Yeah. They have the same like silhouette sort of. Exactly. So they were able to take it to the next level. So the gremlin design was more of a process uh, because there was a lot of consideration for making the design work visually, but also for making the designs practical in terms of being workable as puppets. Uh, Because the gremlins and mogwai are just different moods of the same creature. Mm. So it was a fun design for both of them together. Because you don't want them to look so different. Because the original descriptions of them look so different than the Mogwai. Mm -hmm. And, like, apparently the project terrified Chris Wallace. Because the script had creatures doing so many different things. No, the one scene where they're in the bar, like, that scene went on for a while. Like, they're just... Yes. Being crazy. Exactly. Because it's like... And here's the thing. All of those... All of the movements and all of the crazy stuff that was in the script was difficult those were difficult things to do and obviously it was early in the early horror version of the script which was nowhere near as ambitious as the film became the sheer scope of all the puppetry work was overwhelming they didn't know how much of it could be achieved and at first it was certain that the puppets were the way to go for everything it wasn't a case of hey let's make a puppet movie it was much more of a case of how the heck do we do this stuff hmm. how do we make it do the things that we need it to do so puppets kind of became the option yeah and then once the puppetry had been decided on they were still terrified that they were biting off more than they could chew and that just kept getting worse because suddenly the Mogwai are doing more stuff. Suddenly Gizmo comes into being and is in the whole movie. Suddenly the Gremlins are doing 10 times as much stuff as they planned. Uh, it, was a produ- it was a production that just kept growing. Mm-hmm. And they were terrified that the audience just wasn't going to buy into their cartoony creatures. And so they were trying to create these creatures that were real characters. Yeah, and you can see that. Exactly. Especially in that bar scene. Like, they're just wreaking ha- all sorts of havoc. All sorts of havoc. Smoking their cigarettes, like, literally playing card games. Exactly. Like, what do you, what? what? Because, like, even, so, even in the scene in the house with the gremlin oh, in the yeah, microwave, yeah. Mm-hmm. one of... So was one of the shots that they never thought was going to make it into the film. Really? Because it was so over the top. No, it was good. They shot it twice. Ah. So the first attempt was too gruesome because you saw too much of the gremlin exploding. Oh, my gosh. So the second take just obliterated the window and goo. Mm -hmm. So and, you know, in the end, that was a crowd pleaser. Is it weird that I kind of want to see the first one? I know, right? I wish I could see the first version of it before... They decided on the other one. Right. And it was fun because, you know, like they said, that it was a crowd pleaser on set and they all groaned with disgust and laughter. Mm. So, you know, it hit. And then they used, they had an oversized Mogwai puppet were the, the oversized Mogwai puppets were definitely not part of the original plan on Gremlins. There was no gizmo at first. <laughs> There was no gizmo. There were no sequences of gizmo watching TV, no gizmo driving the toy car, etc. Those were the scenes that really called for the close up puppets. Once gizmo's character came into being, the whole project shifted gears for them. And they wound up making twice the number of puppets to accommodate all that he had to do throughout the film. So they had to double their work once he like made a full appearance into the film Mm -hmm. and then there's quite a lot of stuff that stuff that they attempted that never made it into the film there were a lot of like different mogwai rigs that never really worked well enough or they didn't have the time to film properly 
There were also walking and tiptoe rigs for Gizmo and Stripe that were just too time consuming to film. And there was a jumping gremlin stripe marionette that they really liked it, but it really only worked from like one very specific angle. Mm. But the majority of unseen stuff from the movie ended up being from the bar scene. <laughs> so a lot of scenes from the the bar was there's a lot of scenes that weren't really in there because the bar scene and the theater scene were the two most challenging scenes in the film well yeah that's just because you have a lot of gremlins doing a lot doing exactly. a lot of different things uh but the bar was probably worse than the theater because mm -hmm. they were more active exactly like, the theater, it's like a bunch of them but they're just sitting down like exactly jumping around because all the puppets doing different things they basically they had to build a lot of specialty rigs and there was even a rig built for three gremlins dancing against the wall that ended up <laughs> not being used. Mm. And there were all kinds of gags they did in the bar that were cut from the film. Uh, Joe had put a list on the set so that anyone who had a funny idea that could add it to the already overwhelming amount of work that they were doing... They were basically like, here, write down what you think would be funny for them to do. And the list just kept growing. Mm. And because the original bar scene ran 20 minutes long. Wow. And they cut it down to 10. Yeah. So your no, comment about lie. it being long. I was skipping through it. I was just like, okay, it's they're long. doing this or doing and this And to think, this. there was an extra 10 minutes that we didn't see. Yeah. The theater scene, while more ambitious in terms of numbers of puppets, it was actually easier for them and more straightforward for them to film mm -hmm. as they had the seats, the backs of the seats to hide behind. Oh, yeah. And it was so much easier for them to, like, maneuver. Uh, it was a little bit of a challenge twisting into operating position yeah. sometimes, but they weren't drilling holes in walls and floors for the scenes. So it mm -hmm. made it a lot easier. And then this is what's crazy. They weren't able to have... So when they make... So when there's movies that have puppets, usually the sets are built up on raised platforms. That makes sense. And they, there was not enough money in the budget for that. So Jim Spencer, the production designer, came up with their affordable answer, which he chose one of the Warner Brothers stages that had a pool in it and built the sets over the existing flooring there. So the puppeteers had to go down into the cement flooring of the pool and work their way through the maze of floor supports. It wasn't ideal, but it worked. So essentially, they were working all of the sets where they had the gremlins and stuff were above a pool. What the hell? And the puppeteers would go underneath so the that they would be able to get like into walk. the under the pool. That's so strange. So that they could actually do what they, what they needed to do with the puppets. Mm -hmm. And um, Chris Wallace was like, I have to say that I think I hated almost all of the Mogwai puppets. He hated all of them. Except Gizmo. You can't hate Gizmo. <laughs> they were just so small and the animatronics were so delicate that they were nothing but problems for them. But I loved the gremlin puppets. So he loved the gremlin puppets. Ooh. Because they were good size for puppeteering rigging and just handling in general mm -hmm. there were a number of styles of gremlin puppets each with a varying degree of complexity of facial and head movements they ranged from simple open closed mouth puppets to the super gremlin which had a uh, basically a system that would let the arms and the hands have a full range of motion along with the face and head movements as well as two tubes, like, for bladder-based effects. Mm -hmm. That Super Gremlin had 64 cables coming out of it. Oh, my god! And it weighed a ton, but it was the most versatile out of all of the Gremlins that they had. And, of course, it was also the most time-consuming, so it wasn't used as much in the film, comparatively. And then... They point out that one of their influences for the Mogwai was a creature called the Tassier, which can you can still see today, though it's not as pronounced in the Mogwais. The Tassier is a small tree dwelling primate that is found primarily in the jungles of Southeast Asia. The most apparent primate characteristics are in Gizmo's eyes. However, uh, they eventually realized that the Mogwai needed to be both cute and exotic looking traits that would keep it popular with audiences, particularly children. 
Yeah. And when Chris Wallace received his Spielberg script, he actually was convinced that he'd sent it to the wrong address as the only way to make the story believable was if it was a was completely stylized and they insisted on shooting it on a back lot creating a small town setting evoking frank copra's it's a wonderful life Mm. and they actually included a clip of that in the film in case the audience didn't get the message necessarily so the town itself kind of is reminiscent of that and then Howie's performance was a major part of making the creature credible. Yeah. So for Gizmo's singing, the they auditioned loads of professionals, including an opera singer, but ended up using this uh, a little girl with like a really beautiful voice. And then the most nerve wracking scene in the shoot when the cinema where the gremlins have been watching Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And it blows up. Yeah. Because safety regulations were more lax on Hollywood sets back then. And when they asked the explosive guy how big the explosion would be, he said, well, we've packed it pretty good. (laughs) And they thought, what the hell does that mean? (laughs) And in the event, it was deafening. (gasps) And the heat was so intense, he thought it had singed singed off his eyebrows and it blew the doors of the theater off, as you can see in the film, and it shattered windows on a building at the at Universal a mile away. What? The explosion of the theater was so massive and so intense that it blew out. It shattered windows at a building at Universal a mile away. A mile away. That's insane. When the fuckers were like, we packed it good. They were like, we made this a detonation. No, literally. They wanted. (laughs) We made it go boom. Those people believe in anarchy. That's They're like, let chaos reign. Yeah. For real. For real. For real. That is us. We got you. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I'm like, damn. So how did like Phoebe and Zach like not get really hurt? I don't honestly I don't know I don't know I'm assuming they were far enough away because I don't think that they were directly like close I guarantee you they would not have let any of the actors or anything like that too close but I guarantee you they felt that Mm -hmm. like they felt it because they because he was saying because he said that the heat and it was like the explosion itself was like deafening so whoo that would have been an interesting day I to be on if set. Anybody got fired for that? Because that's oh, I would. Crazy. I would both be because that could have gone shocked really bad. if they didn't, and not shocked if they didn't. Right. <laughs> like I'm not shocked if they didn't fire them, and I'm not shocked if they did. Yeah. But I feel like because it's like wow, because of the a time, great explosion. They, yeah, or, great explosion. Wow, that was a big that was really explosion. fucking dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. That was a. That was a crazy one. And the fact that it, it, the explosion was so big that it was felt a mile away from this, from where it happened. Insanity. Is crazy. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So what you got for me? I have all the gremlin lore. Gremlin lore? The gremlin lore. And Mogwai, of course. But it's basically, it's not like they, this is, it's not like gremlins are... The lore of gremlins does not go back very far. It's not like these things were created a long time ago or like they got an idea from something. Like this is just all the lore that they created. Gotcha. For all of this stuff. Yeah. So basically, gremlin, mythological creature, which originated during the World Wars. Oh. Um, Murray talked a little bit about yes. with his um, yes. snowplow. So apparently gremlins were used to show humans how to create machines that led to the Industrial Revolution. What? Yeah. So Wait, <laughs> what? Yeah. Actually, let me backtrack a little bit. I need to swap some stuff around. Like gremlins cre- helped bring about the Industrial Revolution. The fuck? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so George Guype, he penned the creation for the Mogwai's origin story. 
The origin of the word Mogwai itself is Cantonese, and it means evil spirit or demon. According to Gype specifically, Mogwai would typically reproduce during uh, during rainy seasons. So Which that's makes sense. why they multiply, you know, because they get wet and then, you know, wah. Because they're asexual. They have asexual reproduction. Yeah, because they self they self multiply yeah. like they can they don't have to have a partner mm-hmm. to to make more of themselves correct there's a lot of fish and a lot of like mushrooms and all sorts of different kinds of creatures that all uh do that but actually let me backtrack a little more well shit so <laughs> the mogwai according to gype were created by a scientist named mogterman okay he created these species to be able to live in multiple conditions so that he can send them around the universe. Okay. Yes. He created them basically with the intention to like send them to different planets as galactic diplomats. The fuck? To <laughs> give peace to society. However, that is the honestly, that is the ultimate fucking trick. Yeah. Let's send this really cute tiny thing. And they're going to be like, hey, we want to make peace. And then, like, come back to our home. And it's Earth, which is not a peaceful no, place in any sense of the fucking Earth. world. It wasn't Earth where they were created. Oh, shit. It wasn't Earth. So, okay. So, How do I say this? Earth is not their home Ho- planet. Earth is not their home planet. Oh, shit. Like, it's just this scientist guy named Mogterman in the galaxy. So who they created these guys. Are the aliens came to visit us. Yes. Oh, we have a diplomat. Yes. That was captured. Yes. Turned into a fucking pet. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, the Western world isn't ready for Mogwai. Like, that's the whole point. Yeah. So they, they're galactic diplomats who are sent to restore peace in society. However, we are weren't ready for them because it's implied that humans aren't responsible enough. No shit. Or ready for peace. No shit. So he, Mog German, like, stopped the experiments on the Mogwai. Because of their gremlin side, not all of them, like, kept their gentle nature. Gotcha. If he fucking made these, if he made them, why the fuck did he give them a no, gremlin listen. side? I don't think he realized that. It was kind of like an after effect. Like, oh, gotcha. I, I made the Mogwai. I didn't really realize that. that something else would kind of be uh-huh. in the genetic. And when he finally realized that the species as a whole is unstable, like, gotcha. he had already sent them to all of these planets. Gotcha. Including Earth. And that was the, oh, shit. Mm -hmm. They were peaceful until they were not. So that's where this comes in. Like, they came down, and I'm guessing, obviously, this happened before the World Wars, which led to the Industrial Revolution. Gotcha. This might be separate stuff. I'm not sure. There was a whole bunch of information, and it was just like, I don't know when comes, What? what comes when or what. But I'm. this is how I'm piecing it in my brain. Yeah, yeah. This is what makes sense to me. Yeah. So if I'm creating some Mogwai lore, I don't care. This That's is what fine. I, this is what I found. So to me, after they were sent here, it was around that time. And they helped with, you know, creating, like, showing humanity how to create machinery, which is how they, I guess, they thought peace would be made or something like that. Weird. I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. That's an interesting concept. Yeah. So, I mean, shit fucking mogwai why didn't you help why didn't you help the dad fix his shit right but even though the gremlins like showed humanity how to do all these things humans were still humans didn't acknowledge them like kind of ignored them was like oh whatever which made them mad because they weren't being you know gracious they weren't showing gratitude so the Mogwai became their their gremlin mean selves. Actually, this is just gremlin lore. Oh, gremlin lore. This is just gremlin lore. So maybe it was a situation where the Mogwai, tur- some of them became, became gremlins, gremlins. And the gremlins were the ones that were more like the industrial side. Yeah. But they were pissed that the humans weren't being mm-hmm. respectful. So that's when they started sabotaging all the machines. Gotcha. Which I think is interesting because... Rand is an inventor. Yeah. And all of his machines don't work. Don't work. None of them work. None of them work. And that was before he even got a Mogwai. So yeah. I thought that was an interesting little 
little yeah he he little that's interesting yeah a little tidbit so they became ungrateful you know humans were ungrateful so mm-hmm. they started sabotaging all the machines and this is where the whole world war gotcha thing comes in they would wreak havoc on aircrafts mainly it was mainly aircrafts they would cause engine failures electrical malfunctions communication shutdown bad landings freak accidents and anything that could go wrong with wow. aircrafts, yeah. So George Guype, everything up until Mogterman like realized they were unstable, and but it was too late; they'd already been sent out. That's all George Guype's history. Yeah, Gremlins completely different. What do you mean? And I think they just kind of combined it. So, like uh, Gremlins itself as a species, and then. For this, this podcast film, is they kind of sound like I'm stupid. Combined the two, I guess so. But Gremlins, this lore came became prevalent in the 1920s. Gotcha. So it first came in the 1920s as a way for the airmen to explain the malfunction gotcha. with their aircrafts, um, because some of it was inexplicable. So um, they just started coming up with reasons for why. That makes sense. Um, so the first. It says that the earliest literary reference to gremlins is Pauline Gower's 1938 novel. It's called Women with Wings, where it's it's, and it's located in Scotland. And apparently that's it's called Gremlin Country, huh? where the the gremlins use scissors and like cut wires of planes and stuff. So like that's all in this novel. Well, shit. After the 1920s, I'm guessing. So it sounds kind of... And you're saying this is in Ireland? It's all very confusing. You're saying that's in Ireland? Scotland. Scotland. Oof. Scotland. That sounds like... Because there is a creature that is gremlins that is very much like part of the fae fairy folk stuff. Yes. And then I'm assuming the original like mogwai creature is... is from George Guype. Is Guype's creation. It's, and then, and then he, he was like, let me transform it like, let me combine it with, like, the lore of gremlins and make the Mogwai turn into the gremlins. Exactly. So yes. it's kind of like he they mashed up these two different, very, very, very different creatures and made them, like, relate as two alternate sides of the coin of a creature. Two, like, parallels of, like, one that's very respectful yeah. and kind mm-hmm. and then... And used to like be diplomat and peaceful, as peaceful, and, and then, then they have a whole other side that's just chaos and and destruction. destruction. And that's where they pull from this lore of all. That's of, interesting. I think that's really know, cool. Why, like these somewhat World War Two things, which is what Murray was saying, like exactly about his snowplow, oh, like these uh, gremlins in the machines dropping these gremlins in our machines, yeah, and fucking them up. So clearly he was in, probably in the war yeah. and experienced that kind mm-hmm. of terminology being used, which is yes. fascinating. Mm-hmm. So as for the lore of the gremlins. Okay, so. Yes. I'm sorry, guys, for mixing that up, but. It, it's all good. It's It was a lot of information and it was all over the place. And I, I just needed to talk it out in order to figure out what, i mean in the end no connects. matter what it makes sense because yeah. it's it's two different creatures that were combined yes together one mm-hmm. made by someone and the other being based off of uh, a scottish creature yeah a scottish fairy folk but what's weird fae. is that you know mogwai's like in cantonese is evil spirit or demon even though like so it probably does have so the mogwai that he created probably have like a touch of reality there's probably something in the cantonese like lore that is close but maybe not exact Mm -hmm. you know because you'd think it would be weird that you would call the peaceful creatures demon like demon give them the name well but then again that also belies belays oof belays the hidden nature of them mm. that they then become yeah gremlins yeah. when disrespected mm-hmm. and like they transform yeah and i guess kind of even in the f- film itself the version of disrespect is not following the three simple rules 
So, you know, I'm I'm not incorrect in saying that, like, this is their origin. Yeah. And then, like, Guy created their origin and then Mog Terman is the one who sent them here. And yeah. I'm thinking it's around that time. Like, that's where I'm connecting it. Because Mog Terman is, like, a character created... It's it's like a story. It's it's lore to the lore. Yeah. It's created lore to the lore. He created both Mogdrapin 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 and the Gremlins. He basically made like, hey, here's the creator of the Gremlins Mogwai version. To explain version. where Gremlins come from. Yeah. And said they started off as Mogwais mm. and became Gremlins. But like the lore of Gremlins themselves, like that's just was created. Like that's just been here since the wars. And that's just added in yeah to the mogwai mm -hmm. so going on to the physical descriptions of the gremlins so they're humanoid elves yep and they wear double-breasted frock coats yep that are red or green they're the fa they're the fae they wear hats with feathers and pointy shoes and their skin can be either gold pink green or red hmm. yeah so hilda folk that's the other, other name people for it. say they look very feral. They have hairy bodies instead of like reptilian ones, huh. um, which I guess Mogwai, you know. Yeah, they've got those large pointy ears, mm -hmm. but they have glowing red eyes and the horns that you were talking gotcha. about earlier. Then there are other reports that talk about them having gray skin and look more reptilian. Gotcha. With sharp teeth. And there are other people who have said they look like jackrabbits or bull terriers or like a combination of the two. Huh. So I mean that's kind of classic with all sorts of different creatures that we have. Yeah, and then in other instances, some people say they're made out of smoke. Oh, like they look smoky, or they look like merfolk. Hmm. So they have like webbed hands and feet. Yeah. And fins. Others say that they have bat wings, and that they can be from anywhere from six inches tall all the way up to three feet. Wow. And they, <laughs> this one's funny. They, um, it's even said that they might have suction cups on their on their feet, <laughs> suction cups on their feet, or uh, leather shoes with hooks so that they could um, climb on shit. Yeah, like walk or hang upside down, specifically for the aircraft. Gotcha. Yeah. So lots of stuff. Basically, to sum up that mess of lore, Gaip created the origins. To a lore that has already been here. Yes. Um, so he created Mogterman, talked about how Mogterman created the Mogwai, who he realized they then had a very dark side to them. Which was he, the gremlins. Which was the gremlins. He sent them out. Uh, too late. Yeah. But until Before he realized that they were not great. And then they came to Earth during the war and tried to... Yeah, they were already their gremlin selves, and they tried to teach humanity about machines and gave a boom into the industrial revolution. Yeah, humans being greedy and ungrateful didn't care. They were like, whatever. This is. They were probably sitting there like, no, we did this. We're 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 humans. Yeah, haha. -ha. We didn't need your help. So that made the little gremlins angry. And then they, they sabotaged every machine ever. Yeah. So and it then that shit up, man. leads to the the Gremlins movie. Yes. Of today. Yeah. So. Heck yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> yeah. There's also a lot of little Easter eggs, mostly for Steven Spielberg. Like they have a lot of Easter eggs for you know his Indiana Jones movies, like on the billboards. Yeah. And lots of E.T. figures. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked. And yeah. Anyway, there's just like a bunch of references to lots of things that Steven Spielberg has done in all of his movies. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Which is a nice little nod to him. Mm-hmm. Because he's, he's pretty famous. Yeah, he is. Anyway, I don't really want to talk about those because they're kind of meh. That's fine. I'd rather speak about my one-star reviews. Alrighty. Let's roll into it. Because these were funky as fuck. Okay. I saw this when I was little, and it made me angry then, because you can't feed them after midnight. 
It's always after midnight, so you can never feed them. Now I'm watching ears later, and if they get wet, they multiply? These things are running in snow, drinking beer. Then I got to thinking. Their own saliva, tear ducts, blood, all would get them wet. What was everyone on when they made this? Every character is an idiot. The big stocking hanging in front of the fireplace? Fire hazard? It has a toy robot in the stocking, I assume, for their adult son? There is a laundry list of issues with it, but that would make that would take so much time, so I'm going to stop now. <laughs> How stupid can you be? <laughs> I'm sorry, but your own biology yeah. is not going to make you transform. No. It, they specifically said water. Literally. Like, I'm sorry, but you know, like, have you ever seen... This is not even horror. Have you seen H2O? Right! Just add water. Literally... They could cry. They could do whatever the fuck they wanted. Mm -hmm. But if they they could eat, they could drink water. They they just can't get it on On their skin or on their hair. So they can drink it through a straw. They could do anything they want. But if they get it on their skin, on their exterior skin, Mm -hmm. then it's a problem. Yeah. (laughs) Which is a nightmare in regards. That's not horror at all. (laughs) But it's one of those situations where it's like just because they, you know, have bodily functions does not suddenly mean that that's going to make them transform what got me about this review there are in movies there are obvious things that don't make sense yeah there are just sometimes that happens and you point them out however these are not i don't know how to describe it but these aren't really this isn't something i'm looking at going oh that's incorrect these are issues Th- these aren't issues like everyone hangs stockings on their fireplace yes that's a very common thing that most people did mm-hmm. and still do and still fucking do whether it's a real fireplace or a uh, an electric one you know what i just realized if we keep doing one star reviews and like there's like multiple people for each episode we do we're starting beef with people we don't even know i don't e- know y'all fuckers but i don't give a shit i feel bad um, you sound stupid just a little bit and then they were like all they said was getting wet and the fireplace thing and then they were like and then i have a whole laundry list of issues but that would take too much so i'm not gonna say it those are barely issues, issues. yeah like what do you mean you bitched about nothing minor issues not in things right like for real anyway also his dad's an inventor i'm not shocked that there was a fucking toy robot in his son's stocking mm-hmm. not fucking shocked they said adult son like this kid st- is still in high school and like many kids in high schools like it's a robot i yeah. think that's pretty cool yeah it's just like an action figure who hurt you to make you think that you can't like robots Robots when you're near adulthood man people who don't have whimsy in their lives as adults blow my mind i gotta have the whimsy i have to have color and whimsy people look at me and i'm there i literally have people i've had people in my current classes look at me sometimes and like what i wear and stuff like that as weird and like i remember even i wore like a specific outfit for a presentation and it wasn't like super out there. It was just like my regular clothes. I just used it up a bit. And they looked at me like I was fucking insane. And I was like, do you have no fun in your life? Do you have no enjoyment in like what you wear and, and, and how you decorate and now how I you know exist? what outfit you put together. Cause... It was cute as fuck. Okay. Show me later. But I was like... It just shocks me sometimes that, like, man, people are just not as whimsical as they used to be. I know. Like, what happened to our 1800 dresses? I I would just love to walk around. I don't know. It's not even just 1800 dresses. Well, I know what you mean, but I'm saying, like, back then, like, outfits were made. Like, you went out every day in an outfit. Yes, yes. But I'm talking about, like, not just jeans and a t shirt. I'm talking about the modern problem. The modern and the, the, the current problem of, like, once you reach a certain age, like, you can't, like, quote, 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 childish things. Mm. Like, I like Halloween. 
I love dragons and I love like Dr. Fucking Seuss and like the Grinch and I love all of my like if you're if you like stuffed figures go for it who fucking gives a shit whether you have a stuffy they're fucking comfort things they're wonderful and they're fantastic i will forever have stuffed animals on my bed i don't care i'm gonna be also color middle-aged and fun colors fun clothes for sure why be boring Mm -hmm. i love it when i see these old ladies like dressing Uh, to the nines i saw a i saw an old lady leaving the bathroom at my work and she had she was an older lady and she had purple hair love it was like a really pale, like lavender. It was really pretty. My Nana tried to do that for a second. Like when I graduated, she like tried to do a little thing, I think. I'm pretty sure. Or was it pink? I don't know, but she tried to do something fun. I was like, you go, Nana. But yeah, it's, I don't know. I want fun, weird whimsy in my life. And if that ain't you, we ain't it. Correct. For real. <laughs> I mean, even if you're not, if you, if you like that if you you know you can be plain no one's bashing that no one's bashing it but if you bash people who like whimsy whimsy and call them childish shut the fuck up shut the fuck up (laughs) stay boring stay boring but if you just like you know casual stuff just because you know that's who you are that's fine yeah just don't bash other people just don't be rude about like i'm not bashing anybody who likes normal clothes not at all I like normal clothes. I fucking wear normal ass clothes for the most part. Yeah. Not 100%, but I definitely do. Yeah. But if you saw my room, you see the whimsy. Mm-hmm. Everywhere. Mm-hmm. Because, like, life is no fun just being plain. Just have to judge it up. Have some fun. Have some color, man. If you f- are feeling down because you think, you know, something in your life is just a little boring or... You need change. You need change. Just... Whimsy it up. Whimsy it up. Find some shit that you loved as a kid and go for it. Mm -hmm. Who gives a shit that you're an adult? Heal that inner child. Because I feel like most people who bash people who do that were were like, were hurt hurt as a kid. kid. Heal that inner child. Heal it. Mm -hmm. Get that stuffed animal that you want. Who fucking cares? Right. You want those brightly colored socks? You go for it. You get them. You want to eat that cotton candy very openly? You do it. (laughs) Sometimes it's as simple as some some of those kinds of things. Like, mm-hmm. be that inner fun. This is just to say, be who you want to be openly yeah. and out loud. Yeah. Don't hide yourself. Be your authentic you. Yes. Yes. It's Unless your authentic you is like... A psychopath. Yeah. Then maybe bottle that one up and, and, and put that one away. Like if you're wanting to hurt people. Yeah. Maybe don't do that one. Yeah. Don't, don't do that one. But if you just want some fun in your life. Yeah. That's fine. Anyway, on to the next. Yes. So the rest of these are like gags. Like they're, they are not real one star reviews. They were on the one star reviews, but they are not. But people were just like fucking around. They were fucking around. <laughs> this one says, this is scary. The gremlins have ruined my bus services and have eaten my friends. Help. <laughs> <laughs> the next one says, baby Yoda. Oh, that is a very recent one. Yeah, that one's to very recent. To reference Baby Yoda is a very Grogu, yeah. recent. Mm-hmm. To say anything about Grogu and Star Wars right now from Mandalorian, that it was pretty recent. Yeah. <laughs> this next one says, The gremlins have invaded my school. They have taken the new cafeteria from us. My evidence is that my school's lunch, otherwise known as Sodexo, has been destroyed. People are dying to this cause. I can back this up saying that the gremlins are horrible. The gremlins are very horrible. They're ruining my life experience. And they're making me die to horrible disease named coronavirus. Holy shit. Ebola and cancer. As a conclusion, I can say that the gremlins are gay. (laughs) Oh my god. Yeah, if that was not just someone fucking around and trolling, I don't know what is. I just love that it was so many people who were trolling, because here's this last one. Yeah. Doo-doo. Even dough stripe finna make me act up. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wait, wait, wait. I read that wrong. Doo-doo. Even dough stripe finna make me act up. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's some silly ass shit. Even dough stripe. Anyway. Yeah, it was just a whole bunch of that. I thought it was so funny. Stripe gonna make you act up? Stripe gonna make you act up? Okay. I suppose. I mean, if you're into that kind of thing. You know. Little reptilian puppets. Oh, I also have a picture of what, like, gremlins look like from lore. Look at that. Yeah. 
It looks like he's in a puddle of his pee. <laughs> it's probably oil since he is holding a wrench. Nah, it's pee. Mixed with oil. <laughs> no, but in this picture, he's got like the big bat wings mm-hmm. and like a tail. And he's he looks pretty tall because he's got a wrench and it's like... Yeah, yeah, that looks kind of more similar to how they originally described. This looks like a demon goblin. Yeah, yeah, that's closer to the description that was in the original script compared yeah. to what it yeah. became. Yes, but yeah, that's all I got. Don't let straight make you act up. <laughs> also, are gremlins gay? They're asexual. They asexually reproduce. So I would say no. <laughs> I would say they are, I would say they're ace. Mm -hmm. Not interested. Mm -hmm. Because. I don't mean asexual and asexual reproduction. Yeah. I mean asexual as in like. Ace. Not interested. That's why I said ace instead of asexual because like. Yeah. There's the, they are asexual. They're asexual asexuals. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 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 Yes. Sorry for that clusterfuck of lore. You know, I think it's okay. Yeah. Every once in a while a clusterfuck is fine. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's what this is. Don't worry. We have better episodes to come. Fingers crossed. Hey. Fingers crossed. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Alrighty. So our next episode is going to be Krampus. Krampus. Yup, yup, yup. Krampus. I was just kidding. (laughs) Oh my God. I can't believe you just said that. (laughs) It just came out of my mouth. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. (laughs) I did not think about it. That was the ADHD on hard mode. (laughs) It left my mouth before I could even you, think it, about it. There was it. no filter. It was like <laughs> it came into being and went straight out your mouth. You just witnessed that happen. <laughs> Live here, folks. <laughs> no filter. <laughs> Cramp pussy. Cramp pussy. <laughs> Immediate. No thought. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oof. All right. <laughs> Well, we love you guys. Hope, you know, hope you stand us a little bit. My goal is to have a laughing fit with every new episode. I know, right? That would be God. incredible. Oh, that was oh. this episode. Yep. Tune in to the next one. I know, right? Shit. I don't know if we'll have one, but, you know, who knows? <laughs> so, you know what to do. Like, comment, share us ding bells on the socials and stuff <laughs> her brain stopped working i know right like ding bells comment stuff yep things email us at horrorunmasked at gmail.com let us know what you think about gremlins let us know what you think about cram pussy <laughs> as that's that's what came out of her mouth <laughs> all right you know that's a rule 34 I never thought I'd have to think about. Damn. All right. <laughs> That's a what? You did not I feel, how dare you make me feel old? What do you mean? How have you never heard of rule 34? Look it up. You know what? I'm not even going to tell you what it is. Look Damn, it up. I don't, Google you it. You know, just for that, I won't. Google it. <laughs> you guys Those go- who know. You know. guys Google it and then you tell me. Oof. Mm, we're gonna get a lot of weird emails <laughs> anyway uh follow us on instagram and twitter at horror unmasked listen to us on spotify and itunes at horror unmasked podcast subscribe to us on youtube at horror unmasked podcast and i think with that there's only one thing left to ask will you cram pussy or will you <laughs> or will you not cram pussy <laughs> <laughs> end it end it right there <laughs> no, it's no, no, over no. will you fear or will you fear not